it can do research quicker than you can do it and quicker than your associate or your assistant could do it. It will be able to write emails for you. And, um, and so you, you can see that those, those tiers of paralegals and younger lawyers are, are likely to disappear. Well, this is where I've spent a lot of my career. So um, I started my life um, in the AI world. So after my legal career, um, thinking about uh, the risks of AI to humanity and to business and to governments. And um, so I was the world's first chief AI, chief AI ethics officer. Um, I had to come up with a name and I think perhaps now I might have gone for trustworthy technology officer or responsible AI officer. But in those days, we were talking about ethics. Why aren't we talking so much about ethics now? Well, because people's ethics are different and it's different where you are geographically, whereas the whole world can get behind something called trustworthy AI or responsible AI. And what are the what are the problems? Well, if there are 192 uh, sets of uh, ethical principles around AI out there across the world, and what the world actually agrees is that we should worry about safety and robustness of systems. We should worry about bias in the system. Bias is created when um, you either have biased data, all data, data is biased, and all data is historic because if, what I said a moment ago is now historic data, and that's what goes into the machine. Um, so all that historic bias data is in the machine and it's making decisions from that. And the other way that it gets into the machine is from the people who code. So um, a lot of the coders are young men um, under the age of 30. There are only 22% of um, coders are women. And um, obviously those are pre-generative AI figures, but it's not likely to change that much because you have many more men um, using um, generative AI than you do women simply because of the workforce and the type of jobs that we do. What we're seeing with this tool, generative AI, is that it can do a number of the tasks that we would now ask our young lawyers to do so it can take notes so you could record something and it will tr transcribe it for you you don't need the young lawyer there to take your notes it can do discovery of documents really well and in fact ai was doing discovery of documents really well before we had generative ai so generative ai has just done that it just allows that to be done better it can do all of your research, um, provided that it has access to the correct databases. And there's a lot of discussion around generative AI at the moment about how much it's, copy, it's breaching copyright and um, intellectual property. So um, if companies have only taken data that was available on the internet, then it won't have access to things like LexisNexis that um, are behind a paywall. So you have to be very careful when you're thinking about what, about deploying some of this generative AI, about whether it has access to the data that you actually need it to have. Um, but if it does, it can do research quicker than you can do it and quicker than your associate or your assistant could do it it will be able to write emails for you. And, um, and so you, you can see that those, those tiers of paralegals and younger lawyers are, are likely to disappear. I think it's important just to note the uh, 
role of generative AI in amongst the bar. Obviously, if you're looking at for advice from barristers, it could be that uh, generative AI can give that advice and you won't have to go to barristers. What about in the courtroom? Currently, we don't see any use of, of artificial intelligence in the courtroom, apart from to help in America with jury selection, um, where generative AI can very quickly um, trawl through a juror's past and, and, decide, and help you decide if you want that juror. Um, we could also see the use of generative AI if you want to think about how witnesses is performing so um, as we move forward and we can better assess our facial expressions you might see courts using artificial intelligence to even attempt to decide whether a witness is lying so what does that mean to judges well at the moment i think judges are fairly safe um, but I do see them beginning to use AI tools and in America, they are already using them. So for um, sentencing and bail applications, they are already using artificial intelligence to advise them on the sentence or whether to give bail or not. We have seen enormous problems with those systems, which have enormous bias embedded in them because the American judicial system has such enormous historical biases. And that's something that we really have to sort out before we use these tools mainstream and before we let judges rely upon them. It's interesting because we've been through a bit of an exciting uh, concept of metaverse where everybody was very excited they wanted to get on board with metaverse and now we're a bit more in a metaverse winter or perhaps autumn fall uh, because it's actually very hard to uh, create the content for the metaverse so where we're seeing great applications for business are in industrial um, applications where we're struggling is actually the envisioning and actuality of the vision of having us all being able to go into the meta metaverse where we can do our shopping, we can um, buy our houses, we can inhabit um, the metaverse, we can have all that 3D contact. And um, it, that's really just because it takes a lot of compute power and um, a lot of dedicated resources to create all the background that you need for um, really being immersive in the introvert, in the metaverse. And so um, I think, you know, if you ask me to say what's going to happen in five years, I think we will see that the metaverse is the beginning to show the rewards that we expected it to show for business. We're going to be able to begin to see customers having that exceptional shopping experience where instead of shopping online, they can go into the store, they can feel the fabric, although they're not actually feeling the fabric. Um, and make decisions in real time. Uh, we'll also see perhaps remote working in the metaverse so that you're actually with your colleagues. And I read a study just today that said that one of the problems of remote working, particularly for young people, is that they find it very hard to um, get supervision or proper supervision. But you could imagine a world where you can actually give proper supervision to your um, to your younger members of staff and um, also what young people miss in the in, in the in the remote working situation is actually getting to know their colleagues again that's something that the metaverse I think has a lot of promise to be able to do so uh, releasing us from our physical environment and giving us new virtual environments 
But of course, you know, we need to think about what the balance is. There are many people who probably don't want to spend their whole life in an immersive environment. Uh, let's start with the um, most important thing that you have when you're thinking about digital transformation, and that's data. So first of all, you can't digitally transform, i.e. you can't begin to use artificial intelligence anywhere without data. And it's not any old data. You have to get your data into machine readable form. So one of the problems that we have when we talk to lots of companies, particularly in the global south, is that all their data is on paper. Um, so first of all, you have to have digital data. Then you have to clean your data and prepare it to enable a machine to be run on it. And it's only when you get there that you are going to actually be, even be able to contemplate using artificial intelligence. And the other question about data is, is, do you want your data to be created by human beings um, or do you want your data to be synthetic data? And so there's a big, there's a big difference between the two and what you can get out of it and how you use them. So again, data is your very first port of call. Once you've got data, then you can begin to think about digital transformation. My best advice would be to do it slowly and carefully and to always have in mind that trustworthy AI um, aspect. How are you using it? How is it integrating with your customers? How is it integrating with your employees? There's going to be in Europe a law around artificial intelligence. So if you trade with Europe, you are going to have to comply with those rules. Um, there are old laws on the books that can be used against companies unwisely using AI. So that means that not only are you thinking about the actual use cases of artificial intelligence, you also should be thinking about the risk pieces and involving risk and compliance and law in your digital transformation. But also you should be involving your chief strategy officer. Where are you going with this digital transformation? What do you want to achieve out of it? You can spend a lot of money and really not get very far because some problems actually don't need AI for to solve them. Some problems can be solved better and more cheaply without AI. So having a true AI strategy for what you want to achieve is another really important part of how to get into that digital transformation. I would say that if you are a manufacturing business, then your risks are so much less. And if you're a B2B business, then your risks are so much less. You, if you're a B2C business, you really have to think about how your consumer, how your customer is actually going to react to the way that you are using their data and um, what you are what you're doing to encourage them to perhaps buy something. Um, so lots, lots of food for thought, but first of all, get your data right, and then you can begin to use AI. But make sure that AI is a team sport for the whole of the C-suite when you're thinking about how you're going to use it and whether it's the right tool for you.